Hi, my name's Cameron. I'm a third year master's student studying physics at Nottingham Trent University. I'm here to talk to you about an opportunity I received during my time on my degree. Uh, at the end of my second year, I successfully applied for a paid summer placement uh, with one of the research groups at Nottingham Trent University. And the project I took on was called Dielectrowetting Particle Capture for Environmental Monitoring. This project took a look at air pollution and the reality of how dangerous it can be. Uh, it didn't necessarily look at reducing air pollution, but more how we can capture particles and investigate them in further detail. Uh, as you can see, uh, approximately 8 million people die per year uh, prematurely as a result of diseases caused by air pollution. And uh, it can cause things such as pneumonia, lung cancer and strokes, just to name, just to name a few. Uh, to be specific, it looked more at indoor air pollution, which produces micro or nanoparticles invisible to the naked eye. Uh, so how did I begin my project? Uh, I began by creating some IDE fingers, uh, interdigitated electrodes. Uh, I made them with titanium and gold um, and then added some SU8 and Teflon, uh, partly for durability, but also uh, because without them, then the uh, slides wouldn't work as uh, as efficiently as they could. Um, so after I'd made these, I decided which liquid to use, and I chose glycerol uh, to uh, make my droplets with. And the reason I chose glycerol is because it's got a high viscosity, uh, so I could have it um, hanging upside down. Uh, and we'll get to why I did that in a sec. Uh, and also because it's non-conductive, and we'll also get to that in just a short while. Um, so when I had my droplet on my slide, I applied an electric field, and this is where the phenomenon known as dielectrophoresis occurs. What happens here is um, the uncharged particles uh, in the droplet look for the maximum uh, field strength, uh, obviously, we have a non-uniform electric field, uh, and in this uh, in these conditions, what happens is the droplet spreads into a thin film, uh, and this is why we need a non-conductive liquid so that we have them uncharged particles. Um, and I was using uh, mains voltage, so about 240, 250 volts. You can see from the graph there that as the voltage increases the contact angle decreases and it decreases to about zero degrees at about 240 volts, uh, hence why I used it. So once we had these uh, thin films, uh, I lit a match and blew it out so I could get that smoke rising up. And the reason it's held upside down is because the smoke rises, so we would have a higher probability of the two coming into contact with one another. And once uh, this had happened, we could cut the electric field. And this is what I find really interesting about dielectrophoresis is when the electric field is cut off, it reverts the thin film back into a droplet almost completely how it was beforehand. Um, and then this droplet can be analysed to determine particle size and concentration amongst other things. But first, I just want to show you this video. So what we have here is a droplet of glycerol on 40 micron IDE fingers. And I'm just increasing the voltage by 50 volts a time. Uh, I didn't get it to spread completely into a thin film at this point, but uh, I think it's still really cool to watch. Uh, and you can see there it's spread by a fair amount. And now I decrease the voltage and you can see it slowly reverting back into the droplet it was before the spreading and I think that's just a really cool example of how the premise of this experiment worked. Uh, there is another video I'd like to show you uh, which I didn't carry on with for my experiment but I just thought it would be interesting to try. And what we have here is a bird's eye view of a droplet of glycerol uh, coming into contact with some lycopodium powder or uh, club moss as it's more commonly referred to. Um, and I just wanted to see that if it came into contact this way and reverted back into a droplet, would the particles submersed in the thin film also be submersed in the droplet when it 
inverted? And as you can see here, the answer is yes. I just thought it was really interesting to see how that worked. Um, and I just wanted to share that with you. So now we'll talk about the analysis I did. Uh, so you can see here my uh, setup and you can see the four boxes uh, to the left of the image. Uh, here I had an oscilloscope, a voltmeter, an amplifier and a generator just so I can mess about the voltage and make sure I had what I really needed to have. Um, and you can see the jig in kind of like the middle of the image, which is where I held my slide and droplet. Um, so I'd remove it from there and cover the droplet with cover slip because it's easier to have a 2D problem than a 3D problem uh, and it eliminates the issue of depth perception when looking under the microscope. Um, so I took images before and after the experiment uh, at different mag magnifications um, and I'll show you a little bit of what I found. I found that uh, after there was very much evidence of particulates being caught in the droplet. Uh, as you can see in the lower right corner, there's quite a lot there and they're not much bigger than a few microns. Um, it really helps to just put into perspective how many pollutants can come from just one single source uh, and why uh, indoor pollution is actually a threat we could uh, we should start dealing with. Uh, and this was at 20 times magnification. So I used my knowledge of image processing that I learned in second year and converted the image to grayscale, adjusted the black and white to get quite a high contrast. I then set parameters for a particle analysis uh, where I looked for certain things where I thought there might be a trend, such as eccentricity, so how circular these particles are, the density and the ferrite diameter. This is not to be confused with the ferrite diameter, which is used to determine the length of certain members of the weasel family. Uh, the ferrite diameter is used to determine the diameter of a regularly shaped object which finds the maximum diameter it can have. By doing this, I found some very interesting results. So the first thing I found was that the smoke particles are circular-ish. Uh, they're not completely circular, but they do have an element of circularity about them. Um, secondly, I found that they tend to be uh, around about 10 microns or below. Um, obviously there are some outliers, but you're gonna get that with a lot of large data sets. Uh, which leads me to my next point of uh, there seems to be an upward trend towards the nanometer range. Um, and after discussion with my supervisor, we still haven't quite found out why or um, what this trend even is, um, which I think is rather interesting. Um, but it does tell us that uh, these particles are in the hazardous range, they're in the danger zone, what I mean by that is that they are in the size range that the WHO advises can penetrate the lungs and can cause respiratory issues amongst other complications. Um, so we have found that the indoor pollution uh, has to be of around about this size. But what can we do with this project in the future? Um, well, we can delve into this size distribution trend uh, by utilising dynamic, li dynamic liquid scattering. Um, and this is actually something I did get to try out, but there is more work that still needs to be done on it. Uh, in addition, I wanted to see whether it was possible to attract particles before they came into contact with the thin film by applying a DC bias. Um, and finally, I wanted to make the device smaller and more portable, uh, although I didn't quite get a chance to do that. Uh, had I done so, it would have been great to try this with outdoor pollutants as well, uh, just to see what the differences were um, between indoor and outdoor. Uh, but I'd say one of the best things about this project was the fact that I didn't really feel dictated in how my research should be done. I felt that if something should be done differently, uh, then not only was I given the chance to speak up, but it was, I was also given the resources needed to carry that out. And it genuinely made me feel like I was the lead researcher for this project and gave me real insight into what it's like in the world of professional research. Uh, and at the end of it all, there was a celebration evening where I had the chance to, to present and defend a poster of the research I had done. And a few months later, 
they let me follow this up with a seminar to my course mates and lecturers, which was terrifying, but it did make for a brilliant experience and allowed me to work on my presentation skills. Uh, thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the science that went on here and uh, have a good day.